What I share tonight has been gathered from a great deal of reading, and I've borrowed much, and it's also from 30 years of ministry for the Lord. Now, I, I make no bones about this, because I'm going to start by saying this is probably going to be a challenging message to some. I've been looking back at what the Lord has done over the last few years at Trinity and also what the prophetic words we have received. So I'm going to start by saying it's time for a change. Amen. The invisible divided line between mediocrity and excellent life is evident in many people today. Everywhere you can find people who after several trials and failures resolve to accept the status quo and believe the voice of lies that they just can't do it anymore. And we have those who have given up and they've just settled for what they have. And we have others just going through the motion of a Christian walk. We have others who will just take the easy option rather than pressing in. And there are others who know they have a problem, but they won't deal with it. Well, I'm going to start this e evening by giving you good news. I don't know what kind of situation that you are involved in, but whatever it is, I've got good news for you. There's still hope for you, my friend. Amen. And you might only be a minute away from the answer to your giant problems. The Word of God has got a message of hope for you, and it is this. Nothing is impossible with God. Amen. And that's Luke 1, verse 37. If you want a breakthrough, if you want a crossover, if you want to experience the freedom from the slavery of sinful life, then this message is for you. Go on, turn to your neighbour and tell them this message is for you. <laughs> now it would be good if you kept the Bible near you because I'm going to be using a number of scriptures. I want to start with the story of Ruth. Now the reading would be far too long, so I will give a spiritual scenario of the book. However, it would be good if you opened your Bibles to the book of Ruth. There was a famine in Israel, and it caused the family of Naomi to migrate to Moab, where Ruth is living. Ruth was married to one of Naomi's sons, and was converted to the Jewish faith. She learned the newfound faith, studied God's word, and was converted in her heart through the daily testimony of her mother-in-law, Naomi. But after a few years, a great tragedy came. Her father-in-law, her husband, and her brother-in-law died. And Naomi, her mother-in-law, has decided to go back to Israel. And Naomi urged the two daughters-in-law to go back to their own family and to their former God because of the uncertainty of their future in Israel. Now let me read to you from Ruth 1, verse 11. But Naomi replied, Why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, Return to your parents' home, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry to someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has caused me to suffer. Ruth, Ruth is now facing the crucial moment of her life. Her sister-in-law offer has already given up and returned to her family 
on a god in Moab. And the tempt temptation and the pressure to give up has become very heavy on Ruth. Isn't that true for you and I? Isn't it so easy and so quick to go back to our old paths? You know, when the pressures come on us, isn't it easy to go back to the old ways? In Ruth 1.14, And again they wept together, and Arthur kissed the mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth insisted on staying with Naomi. See, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. Listen, Orpha is a, a picture of a quitter. Orpha loved her mother-in-law, however, she doesn't love her enough to go with her. Like Ruth, Orpha became a believer of God in the house of her mother-in-law. However, the fact that she chose to go back again to Moab is an indication of a backsliding life. For surely she cannot stand alone on a newfound faith in the midst of the pagan people of Moab. On the other hand, Ruth decides to stand firm and take a step of faith. She knows that she might still be weak in her faith, and therefore needs spiritual guidance by a mother-in-law. And since her faith in God becomes her priority, she is determined to keep it and do all possible to protect it. I go on reading verse 16. But Ruth replied, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. I will go wherever you go and live wherever you live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. I will die where you die and will be buried there. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate them. Now come on, Ruth was a Moabite girl. Moabites are Gentile, pagan people who worship idols and are considered sinners by the Jewish people. But what made Ruth so special in God's sight that he makes sure that one of the Old Testament books of the Bible actually bears a name? And I don't know whether you know this, Ruth is one among only two women whose name was used as a title of a biblical book and the only Gentile who enjoyed this kind of heavenly honour. The other one is Esther, but she was an Israelite. First and foremost, Ruth finds the right connection by sticking to her godly mother-in-law, Naomi. So my, my friends, my first piece of advice to you tonight is get connected. Get close to God's people. Don't get close to the world. Choose to get near to those who are walking a godly path. And if you want a biblical example of what happens when you connect to the wrong people. Go and read about Lot. He lost his way in Sodom and ruined his family. Samson is another one who lost his way, getting involved with the wrong person. 1 Corinthians 15 says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Ruth chose to stay close to Naomi. Ruth was able to know the God of Israel through the living testimony of Naomi and this newfound relationship with the true God created a strong bonding on that relationship. Not only as mother-in-law, but they became members of one family, the family of God. So I'm saying to you tonight, church, get connected with people who are connected to God. Build a relationship with other believers, especially those who have an anointing on their life. Let me give you a few examples of others who made the right connection. How about the harlot Rayad? She found the right connection with the, pot the spies from Israel, saved a life and a family. How about the Egyptian ruler? 
he found the right connection with Joseph and the Lord blessed his household how about Elisha he found the right connection with Elijah and he received a double portion of the anointing Timothy found the right connection with Paul and became a faithful pastor suppose they had not found the right connection the end of their stories might have been quite different so how about you are you making the right connections who are you walking with please there's one thing I'm going to ask tonight do not be alone that is extremely dangerous the enemy loves to pick off lone Christians you don't stand a chance on your own I'll be honest that's why church is so important church is not just coming and listening to the word it's having fellowship like we had up at Trevecca getting to know one another sharing with one another and being there for one another that's what that's what church is all about but Ruth also chose to go in the right direction you and I have also got to choose to go in the right direction we've got to choose the direction that God wants us to go in I love the words that she said I will go wherever you go and live wherever you live heading in the right direction is very important if you want to reach your divine destiny Ruth chose the right direction and she fulfilled the will of God in her life Joshua gave the same challenge to the Israelites this is famous words in Joshua 24 it says but if you are unwilling to serve the Lord then choose the day whom you serve would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live but as for me and my family we will serve the Lord Amen. the right direction doesn't promise you and I a beautiful garden or a bed of roses there are going to be difficulties on the way but Jesus promised his abiding presence he said Matthew 8 28 is recorded obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age now I want to speak to those who are committed to following the Lord let me tell you this it's going to be a year of change God has put a word into my spirit change God said this is a season of change and I'm not talking about changing your socks or changing whatever I'm talking about major spiritual change God said to me, prophesy and tell my people change is coming. Amen. Major shifts are going to take place. God said, prophesy change so his people could participate and cooperate with him in the process. You cannot stop change. Change is going to happen. You can either adjust to change or you can resist it that is your choice I hear the Lord saying you've been in this place long enough he's not talking about you being in Trinity all right what he's saying you've been in this life situation long enough it may be a financial situation it may be one of relationship it might be your emotional area of your life it may be a physical struggle with health it may be your spiritual life your walk with God God said it's time for a change how many of you are ready for a change is anyone sick and tired of being sick and tired <laughs> amen how many of you are fed up with the present situation yes. is anyone ready to break that cycle 
the cycle of death, the cycle of sickness, to break the cycle of depression. Am I talking to anyone who's tired of going around and around with the same old problems? Go on, turn to your neighbour and say, enough is enough. <laughs> now I'm going to invite you. Tell the devil, I've had enough. I've had enough hell in my life. I've had enough fear and confusion. I've had enough discouragement. I've had enough lack. I've had enough disappointment. I've had enough rejection and betrayal. I've had enough misery. And I've had enough shame. Now somebody shout, I'm ready for a change. I'm ready for a turnaround. No, I don't know exactly who I'm talking to. But somebody needs to turn around, and you need it today. You need it right now. Somebody facing a situation that is impossible for you to change. It's out of your hands. Somebody in a situation, and you need God to move and turn it around. Someone else, you need a miracle in your finances. You've done everything you know how to do, but instead of getting better, it looks worse. Someone else you're standing in the gap for your children. And you know that if God doesn't move, they're going to be in trouble. But I told you, I came tonight to prophesy. Amen. To prophesy to you in this house that we serve the God of turnaround. Amen. This Bible is a book of turnarounds. Amen. From Genesis to Revelation, we see the God turning things around. One of the worst case scenarios in the Bible is in Ezekiel chapter 37. Anybody know what it is? The Valley of Dry Bones. You cannot get it any worse than that. It looked hopeless, impossible, beyond the point of no return. But hallelujah, when the man of God started prophesying, those bones suddenly started to happen. A change started to happen. The situation started turning around. Bones started coming together. And they didn't just come together, but every bone found its matching bone. And when the prophet finished prophesying, in the very same place where there was nothing but dry bones, there stood an army fully equipped and fully empowered to fight. Tell your neighbor, something's getting ready to change. Because I feel a turnaround anointing in this place. I feel a turnaround anointing rising up in my spirit. Someone is getting your breakthrough right now. Somebody getting free right now. Free in your mind. Somebody's getting free in your emotions. Free in their finances. It's being turned around. And somebody's ministry is being turned around. I've also wrote down here, somebody's marriage is going to be turned around. And somebody at this very moment is getting a healing in their body. Sickness has got to go in the name of Jesus. Pain is leaving your body. With his stripes, you are healed. And that anointing destroys the yoke. Listen, your season is changing. You've been in a winter season, and it looked like and felt like everything was dying on you and around you. But I come to tell you, it's a new season. It's a season of new beginnings. And I'm prophesying new beginnings. I'm prophesying new doors in your ministry. New connections, new anointings, new fire, new jobs, promotion, new avenues of income, new joy, new friends, new confidence, new strength, new health, new fire as we sang earlier. 
Somebody is going to go where they've never gone before. Hallelujah. Somebody's going to take the first new steps into a ministry and into a new territory. So how many of you are ready to step out of the old into the new? However, the condition for God to bring in the new is that you've got to let go of the old. Amen. One of the greatest hindrances to our breakthrough is our memory. We have a tendency to want to drag our past into the future. But God is saying the only way to get the new is to let go of the old. Amen. So I'm saying to you, Forget it. Let it go. Stop dragging it around with you. When Elijah ascended into heaven in a chariot of fire, Elisha prepared himself to receive the double portion. He stripped himself of his old clothes. He got rid of the old. And he ripped them up so that he couldn't put them back on again. Now that's where we need. It's no good taking them off and leaving them so you can go and put them back on. Destroy them. You see, to get the new, you're going to have to separate yourself from the old. And that means mentally, emotionally, spiritually and physically. In other words, you may have to get some new friends. Be advised. Some of those that you're running around with are no good for you. You have to let it go. I don't know whether you know, but when I first came to the Lord, and I became a minister, I didn't lose just a few friends. We felt, we felt like outcasts. Christmas time, we used to have so many invitations to parties, and New Year, where we just couldn't make our mind up which one to go to. When I became a minister, I didn't even have to worry about it. I didn't get an invite. It was as simple as that. You see, some of us have destroyed every good thing that came into our lives because we reprocess, reprocessed everything through the lens of past disappointments. Do you know what I'm talking about? Something comes in and then you start trotting it across all your disappointments and everything else that you've been through. Past hurt, past wounds, they all get rubbed into it. And you've lost it. It doesn't matter what he or she or they did to you. It doesn't matter what they said or didn't say to you. It doesn't matter if they cheated on you, if they lied to you, if they stabbed you in the back. You've got to let it go. Amen. You've got to forgive. It's time to get it right. If there's something in your life that shouldn't be there, it's time to let it go. For those who minister, a word of caution. You can't play around with the world and have the power of heaven. You can't play the field and carry the anointing. Let me make it plain. You can't entertain a spirit of the world and have sweet communion with the Holy Spirit. They don't go together. You've got to let it go. Some of us are so caught up in tradition and how it used to be that we can't even enjoy when God does something in a different way. It's got to be, oh, we've always done it that way. How many churches have I preached in and somebody has said to me, oh, we've never done that. We've always done it this way. And I have to say, well, God wants to do it this way. And to get them to go from there to there, it's a miracle. How many of you know that God is bigger than his last move? How many of you know that the revival that's coming is going to be far bigger than the 1904 revival. Yeah. You haven't seen the best of God yet. No. This morning I shared 
that we've got to let the past go. Don't hold on to it, any of it. Even if God has blessed you, if you hold on to it, it'll become a limit. Let it go and let God do a totally new thing in your life. Now that sounds strange. But even if you've had a blessing, let it go so God can bring a bigger blessing in. Otherwise you're going to be governing God. Oh, God, you did it. I once used to try and put God into a chest of drawers. God, you did it this way, so I put him in a drawer. But every time I looked at the drawer, it was empty. He was, in some, he was doing it a different way. Our God, you can't contain like that. God will do it his way. Friends, I've asked God for an anointing tonight that will break the yoke. I haven't asked him for a flow of persuasive words. I've asked him to release power into this meeting, a power that will break the yoke. I came to tell someone tonight, the only one who can keep you from your blessing is you. The only one who will keep you or who can keep your prophecy from coming into being is you. I reminded of a man who walked into a pizza place. It was a special buffet night. Pizzas were all out on the food bar. There were spaghetti, potatoes, cheese sticks, and of course, the salad bar. He said, I'll have two buffets, please. It was about 10 minutes after eight. And the counter assistant said, I'm sorry, the buffet finished at eight o'clock. And the man said, thank you, and left and walked out the restaurant. His wife said, why'd you leave? He said, I refuse to stay at the place where I can see it, I can smell it, but I can't have it. <laughs> How many of you know that in your spiritual life? <laughs> Barbara and I know what we were saying. We were in Turo, Turo in Cornwall. And we walked around and around looking for a restaurant to go in in the evening. And we walked in, sat down in front of the table, walked up to the counter. I went to order and she said, oh, it finished at 8 o'clock. So we got up and walked out. I was going to have something second best. It's not enough for me just to be close. I don't want to just be close. It's not enough for me just to be in a place where it's happening. It's not enough for me just to walk by and look and smell it. It's not enough for me to sit around watching other people enjoying it. Why can't I have it? It frustrates me. What I'm saying to you tonight, it just frustrates your faith to sit down on the edge of your breakthrough and just talk about how good it could be or will be one of these days. Come on, faith is a possessor. Amen? Amen. Faith is a possessor. Faith will never be satisfied just to look on or just to smell it or talk about how good it could be. Now some of you, in a spiritual sense, are doing that very thing. You're walking around the buffet tables of God's blessing and promises and you're satisfied just to look. Now I'm talking to somebody today who's agitated, stirred in your spirit because you sense God calling you to another level. Is there anyone in this house who knows it's time for a change in your life? Well, come out and get on the anointing. It's time for a change. Amen? Amen. It's time for a change.